Well, we've got uh, three uh, great and informed panelists this morning, so we'll get started. We've actually um, we've changed the order very slightly. Privatization has moved up the agenda. I don't know if that's a general truth, but it's uh, true of this panel. So we're going to start with uh, Dwight's presentation. Dwight. Well, I'm really delighted to be here and appreciate the, the opportunity. Uh, it's a rare opportunity for a Berkeley professor to be speaking on with almost the same title as we just heard our keynoter on uh, a representative from, from Texas uh, on the privatization of the mortgage market. So when a Berkeley professor and a Texas representative agree, I think you want to pay a little bit of attention. What I'm going to do is, is uh, make some brief comments about the GSEs, but uh, the, the core of my talk is really going to assume that, that we have agreed uh, that they basically have to be abolished. And then the, the issue on the table is really how to reform the uh, U.S. mortgage market in the absence of government-sponsored uh, enterprises. I'll focus my comments on a specific proposal that I have, and it's, it's almost eerie how much it uh, echoes what the congressman just said, uh, uh, to uh, uh, create a privatized U.S. mortgage market. And then finally, I will make some brief comments on, on the, uh, some of the alternatives that, that are on the table, although, in fact, my, my two panelists that follow me uh, will be able to speak quite well for themselves. So let me first start with the comments just very briefly on abolishing the uh, GSEs. Um, and uh, it's, it's, of course, clear that they've created huge losses. The estimates are now on the upwards of $400 uh, billion for U.S. taxpayers. But I think a, a serious evaluation of the GSEs really has to look at uh, did they provide any benefits. And the way I think to go at it is to look at their mission statement and say, have they fulfilled, made useful public uh, 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 help for, for their, in terms of their mission? And in my evaluation, they have failed on all three of the key missions. Uh, the first is to help low-income uh, uh, home ownership in the United States. And we're going to have a whole afternoon panel on this. But I think what you'll find generally is that the academic literature finds that the GSEs have accomplished very, very little in this area. A second uh, uh, part of their mission is to stabilize the U.S. mortgage markets. Again, there's a lengthy academic literature that shows that they have not done so, but you don't have to look into the literature. You just have to look in the last three years and recognize that the GSEs piled onto the subprime crisis at the worst moment and clearly made it much greater than it otherwise would have been. So they're a destabilizing influence. The one that's most contentious, I think, is the last point, which is uh, whether they promoted uh, access to, the mor to mortgage credit on a national basis. And a lot of uh, uh, folks think they did. In fact, the GAO put out a report in 2009 that was critical of the GSEs in almost all respects but this one. I, I think they even failed here, and let me make two comments. First of all, the GSEs cr have provided no innovation in the U.S. mortgage market, contrary to a lot of what people talk about. I would point out that the first mortgage-backed security in the United States was created by Ginny May. Uh, Fannie, uh, Freddie Mac didn't even exist at the time, and it would be a decade before Freddie, uh, uh, Fannie Mae would ever make a mortgage-backed security. And secondly, the um, uh, structured finance, the more recent version of mortgage-backed securities, was created out of the pri uh, private sector. In fact, since we're sitting here at a, an event sponsored by the Solomon Center, uh, I can give a plug and say Solomon Brothers, the old investment banking firm, actually created the structured finance form. So the GSEs really didn't do anything in, this, in the mortgage market except for the fact that they had a subsidy and they were, had an implicit government guarantee. Take away the guarantee and there was really no, nothing there. So I don't, I don't feel badly and I don't think any of us should, should uh, uh, worry about the fact that they would not exist anymore. That leaves open the question, of course, of, of what do we do in the absence of the GSEs. And as I say, my, my principle here is going to be create a private market version and it'll work just fine. So that's the principle. One caveat, and maybe this is where I would disagree a little bit with the congressman, is I would keep the uh, FHA, VA, HUD programs active, but in a limited way. And I think the key thing to these FHA programs is to have a very precise definition of what they're supposed to do Nothing more, nothing less, but I do think we need that, that there is a market failure for, for low-income first-time home buyers, and we need to uh, uh, recognize that. The key part of my proposal is a transition plan, because clearly we need to get from where we are today to a private market, 
And my proposal is very simple. Reduce the conforming loan limit by approximately 100,000 a year. It's currently at a level of about 700,000, and so 100,000 a year in seven years, we're, we no longer have GSEs. They also have a retained mortgage portfolio, and this would simply roll off. The average duration of a U.S. mortgage is about seven years, so the, the retained mortgage portfolios would be rolling off on, on very much the same uh, time frame. This staggered uh, procedure has a number of uh, key values. One is the markets would know it's going to happen. You would announce it ahead of time, and so the private markets should, and I believe would, uh, enter in as, as the uh, uh, GSEs departed. And secondly, the, uh, you would start at the top, and so the subsidy or the support for the lower income mortgage borrowers would be retained as long as possible. You, and, it would, would, and, and so it would have a, a, a virtue of making the transition much smoother. Of course, in any plan, you always worry, what if it doesn't work? And I think there's two senses in which it could not work. One would be that the private market simply doesn't enter. Uh, and secondly, what if we have some future financial crisis? And this is another reason that I would keep the FHA and HUD programs active, that that is the reasonable government uh, uh, safety net. So that, in very short form, is, is the core of my proposal. Um, I've given this talk a few times, and so I can anticipate a little bit the questions and answers. Uh, and so uh, um, uh, let, let me comment on what I think are likely to be a couple of the uh, immediate questions. The first, and, and the congressman actually referred to this, or someone asked the congressman, uh, well, you know, isn't 95% of the U.S. market is currently FHA and GSEs? Uh, how can we run a private market when it's, it's not there? And the answer is this is crowding out 101. Any time, and it's particularly true for a government insurance program, that the government enters with a subsidized program, the private market will disappear. But there's no information in that. There's nothing in that fact to tell you that the private market wouldn't be alive and well absent the government intervention. And the proof, and I'm going to give you some of the information here, is that 15 Western European countries run their mortgage markets with virtually no government intervention, and they're alive and well and doing fine. And we'll talk about that evidence. So the fact that we currently don't have a private market is just crowding out. A second question is, well, who's going to fund all these private mortgages? And the ba answer is basically, currently, all of the funding ultimately comes out of the capital markets, and, there, and there's really not necessarily going to be any change. And let me show you a picture. This shows you over a long span of time from 1950, the percentage of all U.S. mortgages that are held by three different categories of, of holders, uh, one being the commercial banks, a second being private market investors, which would include insurance companies, pension funds, mutual fund, foreign holders. They're all under the form here of what I call market investors. And the third and the lowest part are the retained mortgage portfolios of, of, of the two GSEs. What it shows is that the GSEs are actually holding a very small part. It's currently less than 12 percent of all U.S. mortgages. And, and by the way, these numbers integrate whole mortgages and, and mortgage-backed securities. So this is any form of holding is, is going to be allocated to one of these three bundles. And so you can see that if you eliminated the GSEs, and particularly the, the, the retained mortgage portfolios, you only have about a 10 or 12 percent market share that would readily be allocated either to the banks or to the private market investors. And in fact, I'll talk later about exactly how this would trans transpire, but it's, you can see it's not a fundamental ca uh, financial flow problem. What is the problem, and, and people would, should properly say, is, well, but the mortgages will be much riskier, uh, or the mortgage-backed securities would be much more risky than if they have a government guarantee as under the current GSEs. And, uh, and won't that cause mortgage interest rates to rise, and won't that cause housing prices to fall? In a superficial sense, and maybe in an immediate sense, the answer to both those questions is yes, but I don't think we're talking about a very large increase in mortgage rates, uh, maybe 25 basis points. But the key fact is, ultimately, the quality of the mortgages in the system are endogenous. They're going to be created by the system. We've created a system in, that encouraged risky, high-risk mortgages, which means they have to have relatively high interest rates if they're going to be priced for the risk. And, and what I'm going to develop here is the case that the new privatized U.S. mortgage market will be much safer. M mortgage rates will therefore actually fall, and I'll, I'll provide some of the evidence of that. We've already also talked about home ownership rates. Uh, Larry put on the slide showing that the U.S. is sort of in the middle of the pack in terms of, of home ownership. So the GSEs have not created a unique system in any shape uh, concerning home ownership. 
Um, so what is this evidence uh, uh, for, from, from Western Europe? Well, first of all, and you, you'd, I, I have a paper that I'm just finishing on it that'll give the details, but basically the amount of government intervention in Western Europe is really minimal other than some low-income programs like our FHA program. In fact, generally speaking, their programs are even smaller than our FHA program. They have nothing like a government program that would intervene in conforming middle-income mortgages, nothing like the GSEs. You, 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 the 15 Western European countries look like bastions of capitalism compared to the U.S. Uh, government-run mortgage market. What's happened in that context in these countries is that the borrowers, the lenders, and the government have agreed that the way you have to run a private market system is to create relatively safe mortgages where the default experience is a very unusual and rare event. And they've succeeded. And so that's, that's why a private market is going to eventually lead to safe mortgages. Uh, another question that's sometimes raised is, well, we have this wonderful diversity of mortgage contracts in the United States. Turns out Europe has every bit as much. A lot of the diversity there occurs across countries, not, not within a country necessarily, but that's like saying that it's a comparison of states versus the U.S. The diversity of mortgage contracts exists clear across Europe in every shape and form that we have them here in the United States. I've already commented on the home ownership rates. They're definitely not any uh, lower in Europe. And uh, as I'm going to give you some more data, mortgage interest rates are actually lower in Europe than they are here relative to, say, government bond rates because the mortgages are safer. So what are these facts? Uh, and I, I, I have a big table on all of this, but you wouldn't be able to see it, so I'm just going to give you five summary statistics. Uh, of, of the 15 European countries plus the U.S., uh, the U.S. is right at the middle, eight, eighth out of 16 in terms of home ownership rates. Our housing start volatility, me, you know, measured as a coefficient of variation of housing starts over the last 20 years, uh, we're close to the top. We're the, we have much more volatile housing starts than the average European country. In terms of house price volatility, we're fourth from the top. We have much more house price volatility than the average European country. We have literally the highest mortgage interest rates relative to government bond rates among all 16 countries. As I say, of course, that partly is the explanation is our mortgages are less safe, but the, it, but the, the fact is um, a private market generates lower mortgage rates, not higher mortgage rates. The only dimension in which we, you might say we perform quite well is we do create a lot of mortgages. Uh, but that's not surprising. If you subsidize them, they'll, they'll come. But of course, mortgages are not the goal. Housing should be the goal. And so to have just a lot of mortgage uh, uh, creation is, is, is nothing to be particularly proud of. I would also notice the four countries that are on top of us here in this ranking would include countries like Ireland and Spain and Portugal, not a cohort that you're particularly proud to be part of. Um, I, you probably can't see this. Uh, another question that's frequently asked is, well, aren't, they, aren't these countries in great trouble? Aren't they all having their own mortgage defaults? And there was actually a very good study done by the European Mortgage Federation in 2010, which is the primary data collector of mortgage data in Europe. And what comes out of it is that, first of all, they, most of these countries don't even collect data on mortgage defaults because they're so rare. They almost never occur. Uh, you, you, you do get some delinquencies, but even in the countries that are, that are in the headlines today, Ireland and Spain, to this date, the amount of uh, actual foreclosures, actual defaults on mortgages are minimal. Um, we, headline news is about banks. It's about governments not being able to roll over their bonds. It's about banks. If you actually look carefully, it's not about mortgage defaults. And I'll come back and explain why they've been so successful here. But there is no secret here about underlying mortgage defaults. They actually are very rare in Europe. What will a U.S. mortgage market look like in this new expanded version? Well, I think one factor is we're going to have much more choice than we even have today. We're going to have a choice of adjustable versus fixed rate mortgages. You'll have mortgages that have prepayment penalties enforced or not as the borrower chooses. You may have recourse um, uh, uh, enforced or not as the borrower cho uh, chooses. You'll have different maturities, different uh, amortization pa patterns. All of these things, a private market will excel in giving the choice. Now, what I hear when I say this is, but isn't the, 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 the holy grail of this system whether we're going to have a 30-year mortgage? And there's a presumption that somehow the GSEs were the great protectors and creators of the 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. 
Uh, it turns out I don't think it's the truth at all. It's just the opposite. The GSEs actually were detrimental to the 30-year mortgage. The fact that we have one is, be is in instead of beyond the GSEs, and there's two points to note. First, the main activity of the GSEs was to create mortgage-backed securities that were then sold to third-party investors. All of the interest rate risk, all of the risk on these 30-year fixed-rate mortgages was passed to the third-party investors. The GSEs didn't modify that or mitigate it in any shape or form. They just passed it on. So the private markets actually have been dealing with this interest rate risk from the get-go. A second point is that the um, GSEs actually are the primary force in our economy that has created a no prepayment mortgage as the standard. Well, as, as any financial economist will tell you, there's no free lunch, and if you say to an investor, the borrower gets to prepay when interest rates fall, but you're stuck with the mortgage when interest rates rise, the worst case for the investor, they're going to charge a premium. In fact, most studies would suggest that this is about a 50 basis point premium. So the GSEs, by enforcing this no prepayment rule, have basically embedded into these mortgages approximately 50 basis points of interest cost that could go away if the, if the, uh, if the borrower was willing to take on the prepayment penalty. Uh, what we see in Europe and what I'm predicting for the U.S. is the borrower will be given a choice. If the borrower wants to buy the option and pay 50 basis points, that's fine. But if they don't and they want a 50 basis point lower mortgage, uh, that, that'll be available as well. The, the last feature of the U.S. market that is sometimes brought into question whether a private market will work or not is the so-called TBA, to-be-announced market, for the forward trading of GSE mortgages. And this is, a, I th in my view, uh, the, to bring this up is, is an example of, of basically the tail wagging the dog. The argument is made, if we're going to have 30-year agency mortgages, we have to have a TBA market. We need to have a TBA market, so we need to have guaranteed mortgages. They're sort of brought together. No one ever asks, well, do we really need a TBA market? That's the tale. And the answer is, oh, we, of course we need one, and so we need to have the GSEs and, or, or insured mortgages. And I would ar argue that there is no need to have such a market. The private markets trade interest rate um, uh, derivatives widely on both over-the-counter and exchange-traded forms, and there's no particular reason, unless you're in the business of running the TBA market, to think that it's, it's critical to our mortgage market. Okay. Um, a, a further argument here is that the market will create a much safer mortgage instrument. And I, I've, since I'm, I'm running a little short on time here, I think I'll, I'll cut, cut short here because I do want to get to my conclusions. Uh, but the key point here is that when the private market investors, whether it's banks or, or, or um, uh, bond hold, covered bondholders or securitized security holders, have to face the risk they're going to insist on, uh, on high underwriting standards. Just as the congressman said, this isn't complicated. You write down the rules, you disclose it in the prospectus, and it gets enforced. And there's nothing complicated. The only factor that complicates it is if the government starts to say, don't worry about it, we'll bail you out if it comes badly. So I think there's no doubt that safer mortgages will be in the, in the offing. Um, the alternative proposal, and I think we're going to hear it from, uh, from our speakers, um, is going to be basically in one form or another to have the government guarantee all conforming loan mortgages. And they can give you their version of it, but the basic idea is a counterproposal. Instead of a private market, the government should guarantee these mortgages. And first point I'd make, I grant everybody that's better than having the GSEs guaranteed. So if, if I had to make a choice between GSEs and guaranteed mortgages, I'm, I'm with you. But there is no market failure that I, under, that I can see that suggests we need the government guarantee. The European evidence is very strong that the markets work better without a government entity, and they work fine. So why, where's the market failure? Why do we need a government? The other side of the coin is a government can actually create a, a lot of problem here. And the main issue is going to be that the minute you create a government insurance program, it's going to end up subsidizing risky behavior. There's just no doubt about it. I do a lot of work on insurance. If you look at the National Flood Insurance Program, if you look at the U.S. Terrorism Risk Insurance Program, if you look at all the hurricane insurance plans in, in, in um, uh, Florida or the earthquake in my home state of California, inevitably a government insurance program creates two things. First of all, the program is unable to deny coverage, insurance coverage of whatever form, to the high-risk 
candidates. I mean, think of yourself as a politician who's created a government program and you're now going to say to your citizens, the safe guys, we, we're going to guarantee and ensure and give an easy path, but if you're risky, you, we won't do business with you. It's impossible to deny coverage to the risky folks, step one. Step two is the, is the government is unable to ever carry out serious risk-based uh, risk pricing. Because again, think of yourself as the politician. I now have these two pulls, the safe pull and the risky pull. How can I, as a politician, say to the risky pull, you're really very risky. I'm going to charge you double what I'm charging those other guys. Inevitably, there's a compression in the pricing. In fact, in most cases, it becomes indistinguishable. You get a single price. And what the upshot of it is, is you're subsidizing the worst behavior. You're, ups you're subsidizing the risky behavior. Okay, if you just so want one, yeah. <laughs> I think we can have part of this debate on the panel. Okay, one last comment is if you want to see it in action, for, for 40 years the National Flood Insurance Program said they were not subsidizing it. When Katrina occurred, of course, they paid out $20 billion of Treasury money, and, and this came out of the subsidy that, that wasn't there. Thank you. So I'm also going to talk about um, how to reform uh, mortgage finance. Um, I will say that you'll see in my presentation there's an awful lot of similarity with what Dwight just said. And I even think that uh, myself and, and the co-authors that, that uh, Larry mentioned earlier, we're probably pretty um, in agreement on the ultimate end game where we should be. We just might have a few differences about how to, uh, to get there. Like Larry, I am also going to shamelessly... Uh, promote our, um, our book. Um, and I also have the quote. We love this quote so much, we, we all use it, so I'll skip that. And what I'm going to do a little bit different than what uh, Dwight did. I will talk a little bit about um, our proposal uh, towards the end, but I want to take a step back first and just come, up, just come up with what the principles of reform should be. And given those principles, where did the GSEs or mortgage finance go wrong and then given that, uh, how should we move forward? So I think economics is very, very clear on regulation. You only regulate when there's a market failure. So the question you have to ask yourself is what exactly is the market failure, like um, Dwight just mentioned, in mortgage finance that justifies government intervention? That's a question we really um, need to ask as academics, policymakers, or or uh, regulators, and if you can come up with that market failure, then I think you've got to sort of say, if you develop entities, whether they're GSC or GSC-like or, or, or a, a financial or mortgage finance system, it's got to be there to remedy that market failure. That's its job, nothing more, uh, nothing less. So in what, what went wrong so given that principle, what went wrong in general in the financial crisis? I think most people would agree now that the market failure um, of this crisis was basically financial institutions loading up on systemic risk but not bearing the costs of that systemic risk. That's that negative externality, the idea that systemic risk is a, pollution, is a pollutant and you're polluting the environment but you're not bearing those costs. So that's the failure. So now let's look at the GSEs. So let's forget the government support for a second. Just think of them as standalone flanch institutions. What were these institutions? Well, they wrote 3.5 trillion in mortgage insurance. That's seven times what AIG wrote and on riskier stuff. They had $2 trillion in over-the-counter derivative positions. Other than the large complex flanch institutions that essentially they were the largest player in ODC derivatives markets. They held a portfolio of 1.5 trillion in mortgage-backed securities, 20% of which was non-prime. So if they went under, that would lead to a massive fire sales on a really large scale. One third of their $1.8 trillion in, sh in debt was short term, so subject to the rollover risk problems that we saw that occurred in this crisis. And one fourth of their debt was actually held by the banking sector. So the banking sector, that would have implications for runs on underlying banks. And this is, ignores the sovereign debt implications of uh, what happened if the government didn't come in to, uh, to help the GSEs. And after all, uh, people don't realize this, but $1.5 trillion of the US government debt is also short-term 
in nature. There was no more systemic institution in this crisis than uh, the GSC. So there's clearly uh, a market failure there. And it's amplified by three factors. And these we're going to, I'm going to sort of overlap a little bit with Larry here. The first is the obvious one. We all, you know, no brainer. You implicit government guarantee of the debt of the GSC MBS guarantees. You privatize gains, socialize risk you've got a big problem. We saw that in the crisis. I don't think there's a human being on the planet that, that doesn't view that as a problem. The second one, which I think is almost equally important that Larry touched on, but I want to stress a little bit more, is, a capit is the uh, regulatory capital arbitrage that took place uh, in, the, in this crisis. I'm a bank. I make a loan. I make a mortgage loan. I have to hold 4% capital against that loan. I sell it, the same loan to the GSCs, the GSC securitize it, I buy back that security from the GSCs, my cash flow is the same, now I only have to hold 1.6% capital. So you'd say, that must mean the GSCs hold 2.4%. Even my, my uh, seven-year-old could almost do that, other than the, uh, the 0.4, um, could do those calculations. But it wasn't the case, the GSCs only had to hold 45 basis points. So you went from 4% capital to 2% capital. So everything else the same, same credit risk, a system with the GSCs in place required half as much capital, double the amount of leverage. There's no wonder that in the last two decades, the GSCs went from being 7% of the mortgage market to 45% of the mortgage market. Regulatory arbitrage on this level is probably the, one of the most major issues with the crisis, but certainly with the GSEs that would have to be solved. And then the third factor, which has also been mentioned, is sort of where we get the title of the book from. Um, they were guaranteed to fail because you look at the increasing riskiness of their underlying mortgage, mortgages. And this started kind of post-1992, the post-1992 Act. Uh, part of it may be government mandates, part of it might be by choice. But you look at the underlying um, uh, mortgages, they got riskier. Of course, the capital requirements, the legislation in 1992 was set based on the GSCs of the 1980s, the 1970s, as I call it, my mother's GSC. It wasn't based on what the GSCs uh, became. So the uh, credit standards uh, are a problem. And just one uh, statement about the uh, uh, regulatory capital arbitrage um, is if you look at who held MBS securities, 37% of them in 2007 was held in the banking sector. It never left the banking sector. Again, it was all about uh, regulatory arbitrage. So those are the problems. So we have this, this, we have to solve the market failure, and we have these amplifying factors. So if you're going to reform the system, and let's suppose the goal of the financial, uh, of housing finance is to have sort of efficient mortgage market, both at the primary and the secondary mortgage market level, um, how do you achieve this? Well, we think we've got to do three things you have to solve. The first is you have to correct any market failures that exist. So in this case, you have to make sure systemic risk doesn't build up somewhere in the system, whether this is GSCs or whether it's uh, private GSCs. The second thing, and I'll stress this again, you have to have a level playing field between the different financial players. You have to have capital requirements that make sense across the whole system. Banking, shadow banking, and GSCs, or whatever. Or you'll get concentrated buildup of systemic risk. And the third um, uh, thing in mind is you can't, you've got to mitigate moral hazard. So as, as Dwight mentioned, you really have to have market pricing of risks in the system. And we'll talk a little bit in a little bit about uh, if government guarantees are involved how that might take place. So that's, the, uh, that's our three sort of things you have to do to get the, fight, the housing system in place. Uh, so first proposal, I won't talk much about it, discontinue the investment function. Again, there aren't too many people around who believe that should be contained. The rationale for the retained portfolio, which was based on liquidity in the secondary mortgage market, does not pass our principles test that I just uh, gave. Uh, the book has a lot of detail about how to unwind. So to us, it's all about how to transition. How to, uh, the real question is how to get rid of that portfolio and how to stop making these new loan purchases. So we have a big discussion in the book about that. So let me just move on to the controversial issue, 
which is um, restructuring the, the, the guarantees of the um, GSCs. So to do that, I, if you think the government's got to be involved, you've got to give an argument for why the government needs to be involved. What's a, we have this market for systemic risk. What's the argument for government involvement? So the first part of the argument, and I'm not even saying this is 100% uh, true, is the following. Let's put the regulatory arbitrage discussion aside, because that will be a, a, an issue. And also, let's put aside Dwight's point, which is a very good point, that other countries have mortgage finance and don't have government support, so we know it can survive somewhat outside the system. And let's make the, the statement that the most efficient mortgage finance system possible is one that involves securitization. That may not be true, but let's say that is true. And by the way, the uh, other countries don't really have well-developed securitization markets like the, uh, the US. So what's the economic model of securitization? Well, I've taught it. You know, I've taught fixed income for 20 years. Uh, until the crisis, I was always teaching the, the faith on financial innovation. Um, so I'm going to put aside some of the problems with securitization that I, I think that um, Dwight probably alluded to. One of the skin in the game, take that aside. Also, a newer one, we've talked about the loan renegotiations. You slice and dice the loans. It's not so easy to uh, ne renegotiate them afterwards. Put that aside. I think there is an argument that securization does turn lead into gold. Why? A bank makes liquid loans, big liquidity premium. Um, big liquidity premium means higher interest rates. Uh, you come along, you take these loans, you pull them into a portfolio, you create securities backed by these um, loans, you create an actively traded secondary market, liquidity premium disappears. Um, pricing gets better, interest rates fall. Um, you've kind of done a Pareto improving uh, innovation there. And we've got a second advantage of securitization. That's if, to the extent mortgage markets are systemic in nature, you've got all this risk concentrated in the banking sector, which we worry about because of its importance to the economy. You can transfer that risk out of the banking sector to a capital market at large. Uh, that allows better risk sharing. And I will say this is clearly not what happened, either one, um, in um, the financial crisis or maybe even the way uh, securitization developed in the U.S., but that's sort of the, the economic uh, thing we would like to, uh, to achieve. Okay, so that's, that's the first part of the argument, that we need securitization. The second argument I call the genie in the bottle problem. If we were starting from scratch, the question is, you probably might not need government guarantees. Securitization could develop just uh, naturally, a little bit the way that uh, Dwight talked about. But unfortunately, we took the genie out of the bottle um, 25 years ago. And so if you believe securitization needs guarantees, so if you think the securitization market needs guarantees, whether they're public or private, but it needs guarantees in the system, because of this genie in the bottle problem. And what do I mean by that? We've had 25 years of capital markets have developed to become reliant on guarantees. I don't know if you all saw Bill Gross's statement when he, uh, at, at PIMCO, at one of these um, uh, treasury things, he was like, if I don't get guarantees, I'm out of this market, right? So whether that's true or not, it is based on this thing that they have 25 years of experience uh, in this area, they're very reliant on guarantees. So we somehow have to put that genie back into the bottle. Um, and so our solution is a little bit about trying to achieve that. Can the private market provide these guarantees? So let's suppose we need guarantees now because the genie in the bottle. We need guarantees temporarily until we can create a, sec a securitization market that doesn't rely on them. Um, can the private market do that? Well, it's certainly capable. We've seen it uh, provide guarantees and insurance in other markets. It market prices, which is good from our uh, criteria that we, we just set forth about how to regulate the system. So it, 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 price, it gives market pricing. But there are two issues. The first is, can you have a really, truly private market for mortgage finance when the rest of the system is so heavily, so heavily um, under the safety net? There was a uh, last year, the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond did a study 
that showed that 58 percent of all the liabilities in the U.S. now are under some type of safety net. So we have to fix that problem. We just can't have um, one system be totally private and not the other part of the system. The second problem is there's a little bit of a feel we've been there, we've done that, right? There's, when you have private guarantees, you can get this systemic buildup, this buildup in systemic risk because of uh, guarantees and systems. So I'm going to give an example. Uh, leading up to the crisis in 2007, we actually had a trillion dollars of private mortgage insurance. 80% of that was performed by just six monoline companies. In 2007, in that year, they lost, to get 2008, just 2007, they lost 60% of their market value. They weren't well capitalized. So if you're going to have a private system, you have to have a very heavy hand in terms of the management of systemic risk, which again is what we consider the market failure in this um, crisis. What about the nationalization public utility model then, if you think the private market can't sustain itself? And that was, has, that was mentioned. Um, so this would be the government-run utility like Ginny May that people have, have talked about. Well, there's a positive side. Uh, maybe it reduces systemic risk. It probably does, although it actually may create a lot of risk-taking. So it, there's a bit of a trade-off there. And they will collect fees for guarantees, so there'll be some, some uh, relationship between what they collect and what they pay out. I think on the negative side, though, uh, there are a number of reasons why this is a poor idea. The first is, can we think of, and this goes to, Larry, to Dwight's point, can we think of one example where the government has price guarantees well? I give, I give me this uh, talk, not this exact talk, but uh, similar talks about the financial crisis, and I've talked about deposit insurance. I give the example of my mother, who knows no uh, finance, has trouble adding up uh, two numbers together. She's not mathematical, but in the, before the crisis, she had her money, her CDs, in three institutions. Any guess what those institutions were? Washington Mutual, IndyMac, and Wachovia. Okay, why is that? Because they offered the highest rates because those, the funds were guaranteed. She knew it was guaranteed, she knew they offered the highest rates. Just that simple statement should tell you something about the way the government handles uh, guarantees. The second problem is really a lack of accountability at the government level. It's got to lead to poor governance. No matter how well intended you set up the system, initially it may work, three years later, five years later, ten years later, we know how bureaucracy works. And then the final statement is just do we want, and this goes to the congressman's argument as well, do we want the U.S. government in this business? Is that what we want the balance sheet of the U.S. government to look like? So we're pretty uh, negative on the nationalization front. So our preferred plan is what we call this hybrid solution that, that Dwight referred to. So what we want to do is we want, kind of, we want our cake and eat it too. We want the liquidity of the mortgage market, but we also want to solve the problem with the pricing of the guarantees and the lack of market discipline and the buildup of systemic risk. So we're, we want to create a private-public partnership the private sector provides insurance uh, by establishing a market price. To us, this is crucial, this is important. If you have a market price, private markets don't get crowded out. That will allow for less government involvement over time. You may, you'll get the, the good interest rates because of the high liquidity, but those interest rates will reflect the market and credit risk from the, the private sector. The problem is, the market failure is systemic risk. Is there enough capital to provide systemic insurance in the private sector? So we think the answer may be no, so most of the insurance would have to be purchased from the government. So our view is private insurance to price the market, but not too much to be systemic. Now the government, written into law, and I mean this isn't possible, uh, would be a silent partner. They collect the premiums, and if something goes wrong, they write the checks. They don't have any other role other than that to sort of avoid some of the issues that Dwight uh, alluded to. Or what about a resolution authority for these private insurers? They should be well capitalized, so regulated as such, not fully capitalized. So they might fail, 
and then the MBS guarantees of these insurance would become para pursu with their unsecured debt. We think that's actually a good thing because the, um, that will create market discipline both at, at the institutional level as well as at the, uh, the MBS level. Now remember, those guarantees though is not the whole mortgage. They're only guaranteeing a portion of that. Uh, the, the majority will be backed by the, uh, um, the government. If those institutions are held within a larger firm, they have to be ring-fenced. You can't let the, the regulatory arbitrage take place. And to a further point, capital requirement rules need to be set up to avoid the type of regulatory arbitrage that we saw earlier. So that's a, to us, that's a very important part of, of, any, of any credible uh, plan. Uh, now, this does contrast with other proposals that, that the, if in some sense, a lot of proposals seem to be moving a little bit towards the government providing till risk insurance. Uh, we're not a huge fan of that, and for two reasons. Um, so our plan focuses on uh, the pri private markets pricing the guarantees. Till risk insurance programs generally are referring to the government coming in and pricing it. So it's going to run into the same problem that we have when the government tries to price the guarantees. Also, in our plan, because from the get-go, there's this shared relationship between the government and the private sector, the private sector controls a quantity of the risk, it bears a risk, it has a good alignment of incentives. If you have till risk, the private sector is going to control the quantity of the till risk borne by the government. We just know down the road, the private sector is going to figure out how to pass on a lot of that risk onto the government and be uh, mispriced. So we think it's dangerous uh, to go back to a GSC type um, arrangement in terms of uh, guarantees. Uh, that said, our goal over, the, over time, like uh, Dwight's, is to reduce the role of, of government. We think it, the market would perform much better without it. So that includes two things. We believe only conforming safe mortgages should be backed. This is like the old GSEs. And like Dwight, we very much like the idea that's been uh, floating around and that Dwight's a big advocate. We think the idea of reducing the conforming limit over time is one way to sort of get us there. I don't know whether it's uh, 100,000 every year or, or whatever, but that should, if that's written into law, then it allows the markets not to be crowded out. Let me just say a couple more things. Um, but we, what about non-conforming mortgages? That's 50% of the current market. Our private-public partnership could work there, right? We could have the private market uh, price the guarantees on non-conforming risky mortgages, and the government could be a silent partner. So in some sense, that might work, but what if the market prices are wrong? And we saw some examples of that in this crisis. That would be a big boo-boo on the part of the government backing that. So we're not in favor of that. We think it's too dangerous, too risky. Um, it puts the system too, at too greater odds. There's too much room for manipulation um, for, for, for that to be a, a necessarily good solution. So that means it's got to be left to the private market. And it means if you're going to have uh, um, non-conforming mortgage in the private market, which we think you should be able to have, whether it's the congressman's solution about the warning labels, we would actually like it a little bit further than that because I think that what we saw in this crisis was it wasn't really the Norwegian school, the Norwegian village, or the Wisconsin school district that lost all their money, although they certainly lost money. It was large, complex financial institutions taking big bets on these securities themselves. So we think if it's in the private market, you've got to impose high capital requirements, concentration limits, maybe a systemic risk tax to limit the, the buildup of systemic risk, leverage requirements at the asset level, credible resolution authority. You've got to throw the full force of systemic risk management at, at that problem. And then just as a segue into, this is the last slide, into the afternoon talk, which um, Larry alluded to, I do think that in terms of mortgage finance, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are a big part of it and how to reform the system. But you can't really reform it without dealing with the role of home ownership in, and the way we, we support it. The CBO estimates that last year, and I know it was an extraordinary year, but approximately 300 billion worth of subsidies were thrown at the housing and mortgage market. That is a lot of money, even in 
2010 terms, 300 billion is a big, for an annual budget, it's a big, big chunk. And that tells you there's massive overconsumption in housing. And I think the question's already been asked by Larry, but it's gonna be addressed in the afternoon. Uh, is real estate investment as productive investment as business capital, human capital? Almost all economic studies say no, so we know we've got a big distortion. If you think about supporting low-income housing, as Dwight mentioned, uh, studies have found that the GSEs really re represent a wealth transfer more to the well-to-do than to the poor, so they didn't serve that function. And then finally, if home ownership is home ownership socially optimal? I'm not sure it is, but if it is, it's not clear that GSE entities are very indirect ways of doing this. So I'm gonna hand it over now to uh, uh, Susan. Thank you. Susan. Uh, there's much that we uh, agree about, and <clears throat> we agree that uh, keep FHA, Ginny May, need for private market capital at risk, the need for mortgage choice, ARMs, FRMs, uh, the need for, to mitigate moral hazard across all issuance of mortgages, and most importantly, the need to prevent systemic risk. So there's also a question of why intervene at all that has been raised by both speakers, and uh, one has uh, suggested we need public intervention, at least the FHA, uh, Ginny May level, the other, that we need a guarantee. And the suggestion of what is the market failure have been addressed in part by both. In my conversation today, what I would like to introduce is an explicit discussion of why there is a market failure, and there are two. And the market failure that I would like to put out there that hasn't been explicitly mentioned is, I think, the driver for the way forward. In order to do this, let's take us back for a moment very quickly to the origins of the bubble and the crash. And I believe they are, in, let me review very quickly the key points where I'm going on this, is it is a pro-cyclicality of leverage that brought us to the crash and the boom first and then the crash. It was a supply side phenomenon, fee driven in part due to asymmetric information and as you'll see, mortgage finance spreads in the private sector declined. The mortgage-backed securities that were issued by PLS, the spread uh, for risk declined as the volume increased and as risk increased. Why is this? Because there was a mispricing of risk, and the reason there was a mispricing of risk was because of market failure. There are two risks in mortgages. There is an interest rate risk and a credit risk. In order to deal with these risks, they need to be appropriately priced. We need private capital, we need liquid markets, we need pricing of securities that trade and price both risks. In order to do so, we need standardization of mortgages and MBS. So just to take us back for a moment, as we moved into this period over decades, we actually did not have a build up, even through the crisis, of debt on the part of the government versus GDP, or on the part of the corporate sector. Debt build up on the household sector and the finance sector. And the build up in the household sector was entirely in mortgages. And you can see on the right how the build up in debt happened pari pursu with increase in housing prices and home, mortgages, home ownership, although home ownership peaked before in 2004. That's a separate interesting question. Now, as the mortgage debt expanded, we had a specific explosion of debt in the period 2003 through 2006. Interestingly, this was a worldwide phenomenon, the increase in mortgage debt and increase in global housing prices in the period 2000 to 2003. But starting in 2003, interest rates actually started increasing, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. In the U.S., mortgage rates uh, continue to go down as we understood and found out later through the private label issued securities, but interest rates overall actually increased. In addition, not only did the volume of PLS increase, but the quality of PLS mortgages decreased substantially, as you could see on the right, the increase of, uh, no, of, no, of interest only and no documentation mortgages. <clears throat> 
So let's look at the pricing of the PLS MBS over time. And uh, on the uh, left hand, you see the red line shows the issuance of PLS MBS, just the same as the last graph. And the bottom blue line is the pricing. That is the spread over treasuries. On the other graph is the spread of the B tranche of the PLS, again, over treasuries. You could also look at the spreads over corporates. Same story. Why is it, let me return to why is it that credit cost decreased in this sector. I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, let me quote a recent Wall Street Journal article just from a few days ago. The article referred to the Federal Reserve Board's looking at housing prices in 2005 and discussing the fact that they were likely to be in a bubble by about 20%. And by the way, they were right on. But further interest, but interest rate rises as a solution were rejected, and for good reason, I think we can say in retrospect. It was also hoped, expressed, that high, further higher prices themselves or higher prices themselves would limit the bubble through constraints. But as we all know, what actually happened is after 2005, the constraints were lowered further and at, with cheaper debt, with easier uh, underwriting conditions. So today, again, according the, to the Wall Street Journal, the Federal Reserve Board economists have started to discuss whether uh, tools such as consumer regulations or supervision practices should be employed to control bubbles before they become dangerous. But how? With what controls? Capital requirements? With what identifying data? Discretionary? Should these controls be discretionary? Would that work? Automatic? Then again, with what identification? Before I come back to the mispricing as the basic failure, let me talk about the second market failure which has been recognized here so far. And it does have to do with the pro-cyclicality of leverage. As we saw, leverage drives up prices, higher prices become anticipated and ratified by further increases in underpriced credit, because credit is issued at appraised values, which is market value. Credit expands, prices rise. And as prices rise, loan-to-value ratios look very reasonable, even though they may actually reflect a bubble price and loans that are in the money. The put option, the default put option is in the money. The turning point is when credit standards cannot be eviscerated any further. At that point, prices stall because there's no effective demand expansion. Credit then freezes. With freeze, we have actually decline in housing prices because of the lack of availability of credit, and also because the stall itself is inconsistent with level prices since there's been capitalized price increases. So prices fall, and then we have foreclosures. So foreclosures and defaults are actually not an early warning sign. They're a late warning sign. And that's where we are today. And then there is the inevitability of a bailout. I think we need to recognize that. And then also credit standards tighten up, again, pro-cyclicality of credit. So the externality that has been recognized is that foreclosures drive pricing not just for some, but for all, creating a systemic crisis. But the other market failure is that the put option that's embedded in mortgages gets mispriced. Why don't markets correctly price for risk? Well, there's moral hazard, there's principal agent conflict, there's information asymmetry, they're all embedded in institutions, we could try to write those. But the more basic problem is the limited ability to short sell the underlying asset, that is real estate, that is housing. That's why real estate and housing is subject to bubbles throughout the world, throughout the United States history, Throughout the world, we've had many such, including the Asian financial crisis, including Japan's two lost decades, uh, including the SNL crisis, many such crises. So the question is not just that the underlying real estate cannot be easily short sold. I mean, we do have some indexes, Case-Shiller, very limited liquidity, but also the RMBS, which are derivatives on the underlying assets themselves in the market that we created or the market that we had, the RMBS could not trade 
and liquid markets to trade and correctly price default risk. So what happened was there was a limited ability to understand and therefore correctly price across the board RMBS through the private label system, and therefore the put option pricing declined, which of course effectively encourages demand for mortgages, and at the same time constraints were breached again, effectively increasing the demand, and makes the underwater loans look temporarily good because the underpriced debt is translated into overpriced assets. That is, efficient asset prices, efficiently priced assets will price in lower credit costs. So this is, uh, and then there becomes an incentive to go short across the board when the knowledgeable insiders know the put option is in the money. And then that's the time where you see the CDOs and where you see every, everything going quickly in attempt to get out the loans that one can and the fees that, that one can. So this is a rationale for a regulatory response. Instruments to trade credit risk and instruments to correctly price credit risk. And we need standardization for liquidity to create such instruments. They won't happen uh, automatically. This is my last slide. So what is the implication for government role? And part of the question is here is we, we all agree on so much. We agree there is a government role. I believe there would be cons uh, consensus on the need of standards. And there is even consensus that in the short run, we are going to have to rely on moving away from Fannie and Freddie slowly. And we do need to rework this broken system. But what if, in fact, we move away from Fannie and Freddie slowly or quickly, and there is no private capital that comes to the game? Right now, we have a jumbo market, which is very, very thin. There has been very few MBS issues. To my understanding, there's only been one significant one. And those, the group that issued that has put out a white paper saying they are hesitant to issue more without a system in place that has standardization across the board. So we have to have regulation of private RMBS markets, which includes a disclosure and trading framework. By the way, in Europe, when there are, where there is securitization systems, they have this. We need data verification. We need standardization for liquidity and for analysis. We need derivatives trading over exchanges, again, standardized RMBS. We need private and public sector monitoring of the credit cycle. Now, why is it that we can't just rely on the private sector, and this is why I don't entirely agree, although I think the, Matt's, uh, the uh, suggestion that's been put on the table is very intriguing. I don't entirely agree with it. I have to understand it more. I haven't yet read the book, but the, um, I will, but the, um, my concern is why won't we have a race to the bottom again? The race to the bottom happens very quickly. There's a switching phenomenon and mispricing of credit can happen extremely quickly. So why can't these entities that are pricing for credit risk again misprice? And by the way, it's one side pricing of the credit guarantee, not the government side. But if there is, in fact, uh, perhaps the details explain this more, then maybe there is some meeting of the ground here. Because I also do believe there is a role, again, not necessary for the long run, I do think eventually we could have standards which would not require uh, there to be only a public sector. There could very well be a private sector that trades without a catastrophic guarantee. But certainly in the short run, we do need, I believe, government guarantee. And catastrophic insurance, I do think, is a way of putting private capital at risk in the first loss position and having eyes on by the private sector with trading as well as the backstop of the public sector because in the end, with a significant market failure, the public sector will come in. It needs to be priced from the very set from the get-go and the public sector needs to have eyes on along with the private sector. Now, why weren't there eyes on this time? As you can see, we did track the pricing of credit over time. That was with a considerable lag. We were not able to do that real time. We had the data, but the data were impossible to interpret because of the multiplicity of mortgages and the multiplicity of RMBS and the lack of verification of what was in fact in the securities. So in fact, while you could short sell 
individual issues, and we all know of the Abacus case, and that was possible. Much of the RMBS was not short sold, but simply put into portfolio, yes, of the Norwegian pension fund, and yes, of even Lehman, and yes, of the banks. This misunderstanding of risk, mispricing of risk, we cannot put the macro system, at, again, at risk in that way. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for our panelists. Um, I would observe that the men talked well over the time limit and the woman observed the time limit. But, but I think the data set's too small to draw any conclusions <laughs> from that. Um, anyway, thank you very much to all of the panelists, um, no matter how much time you took, because, um, and I did indeed let it run slightly long because I thought that it's a, a detailed subject and we had some really interesting points here. Um, I didn't notice anybody really defending Fannie and Freddie or or heavyweight government intrusion into this market. Was I missing something? Or do why why if um, the suggestions that are being put forward vary from simply taking the government out of it altogether to much more limited roles, why did we allow the government in the US to take such a large role in the first place? Has anybody got any thoughts about that? Well, it's, it's a long history, actually, uh, and it, it goes back to 19, I mean, Fannie Mae was created in the 1930s in the previous crisis. Um, it, the, the modern form of, fan, of the GSEs actually was the result of a strange quirk. Uh, this was Lyndon Johnson's uh, presidency. Uh, his his uh, records have just become public, and so the details of this are now public. But basically, uh, the, Fannie Mae was a government agency. All of the debt they were issuing counted as part of a deficit. This was in the middle of the Vietnam War. Lyndon was absolutely determined to get the, uh, make the budget look better. Uh, the records that are now public indicate there was a huge fight within his administration with the economists saying, if we spin off Fannie Mae into a government-sponsored enterprise, there's no controlling what crazy things they might do. And Lyndon Johnson, in his typical fashion, said, screw that, I want them out of the budget. And, and that's how Fannie Mae got created. Once you had Fannie Mae doing, um, uh, working with the banks, the SNL said, we want our own agency. And that's how Freddie Mac right. was created. And, and, and the slide continued forevermore. So it's probably the largest, financial, in financial terms, the largest unintended consequence ever. I would say 100%. <laughs> if, I could, if I could add one, one quick thing. Um, I think for many, many years, people have you know, been screaming about um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And, um, to Dwight's point, the, one of the points we make in the book, and it's not just our point, as many have made it, is that it became a very convenient tool because it's off balance sheet for the government to transfer wealth, not just really to the poor, because as we've said, it's really to the well-to-do of making people kind of happy. Banks are, everyone's happy except when it comes due. So I think that that's a large part of how it developed. So, uh, let me add a, a point or two. Fannie Mae itself came out of one crisis, the Depression, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac came out of a second crisis. I agree exactly with what Dwight uh, said, and two wars, but of course the crisis was the savings and loan, which made the move of the fixed rate mortgages uh, offloaded to Fannie and Freddie at that period. Uh, but what did they do? I mean, what was the rationale? Were the people who put this in place simply, you know, crazed? No, I think that what Matt said earlier, that there is something about securitization, that there is a turning lead into gold. So securitization is, in fact, I don't think any of us is arguing against securitization. And in fact, for securitization, you need uniform standards. That's what Fannie and Freddie were explicitly put into place. And remember we, for, and remember we did have a period uh, uh, called the Great Moderation, have we yet forgotten this, of uh, decades, 1980 to 2000, where in fact we had a system that appeared to have worked, and Fannie and Freddie were part of that system, and standards held. But standards did not hold in the period 2000 to 2006. And why, I think, is a question that political economists, economists, political scientists, historians are going to be asking for quite a while. I just wanted to ask one other specific question because it, as, a, as a Brit, it always struck me that uh, one of the enigmas of the crisis was that um, 
from the consumer point of view, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage that you could roll out of yourself and the investor took the risk was one of the great consumer products of all time. Um, and it, you don't get it in other markets. And um, Dwight made the point that that was not to do with the GSEs. It was a phenomenon that the private market could produce. But it clearly doesn't produce that solution, that, uh, that product in, in the UK, and I think more broadly in Europe. I'm not quite sure. Oh, Does well, anybody I, have any? Oh, oh well, I mean, Denmark is primarily a fixed rate mortgage market. Long term, 40 year fixed rate. Sweden has them, Netherlands have them. Okay. U U UK is correct. the outside force there. So let me, uh, Matt, you want? No, no. Sorry. no. Uh, absolutely agree that uh, Denmark is an exemplar of the fixed rate mortgage uh, and other countries such as Germany, but it isn't as though the system in Denmark um, arose haphazardly. There is a standard. Mm -hmm. These are all quite standardized and going to Matt's point, genie out of the bottle, I mean, it's difficult to do the coordination to get the standardization through simply saying, okay, everybody have, it, have at it, issue your own securities. You wouldn't get to the Denmark system that way. And the underwriting standards in Denmark are very, very high. Extremely high and across the board yeah, and maintained, yeah. not by accident, not by the private sector, but by regulatory controls. And do you think, um, we're in Washington at the moment, do you think that um, these lovely proposals, which are theoretically perfect, have any chance of getting through Congress um, whatsoever? I think the congressman liked Dwight. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we, we are not in that much disagreement, as, as, you, as you mentioned. It's a little bit on, as I would put it, a little bit on how to put the genie back into the bottle. We have slight disagreements. And I think that generally both aisles of Congress would not be, be standing next to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and holding their, uh, putting their arms around them. I think that everyone realizes this was a broken system. I think the, there will be a little bit of an ideological fight about whether there's any government involvement at all. Um, and, you know, we can debate, as we have here, about, uh, you know, to the extent you need it, at least, you know, I would argue you need it in the transition. Um, but the, the, the debate may go beyond that into sort of what the final uh, solution looks like. Can I I, I would say I think the political forces, as we've heard this morning from the congressman, but there's a whole house full of such congressmen, are very powerful toward privatizing the market. But, and the big but is, but there is a latent fear. What if we have another, what if it doesn't work? What if there is another systemic crisis? What if there's another mortgage market crisis? And I think that's where the issue has to be met. One needs to create a plan, either that you're confident that the market will create safe enough mortgages that that's not an issue, which would be my extreme case. But I'm, I'm not that far from either of my two colleagues of saying, if we could design an insurance program that, that took care of the systemic risk, and if the government had to provide that insurance in a second loss, uh, high tranche basis, um, I think that's that that's a winner if you can come up with it. Uh, I, I just don't know the details of how you create that, but, but my colleagues are working, I, I guess. I get back to that one thing, and then maybe Susan can jump in, is that my, one of my biggest concerns, and this is not on the agenda, if you look at the Dodd-Frank Act and you have a completely private market for mortgage finance, which is a huge part of the financial system, I worry about private GSEs. I worry that the Dodd-Frank Act is not done enough to deal with systemic risk in the system, and if we're not careful, we're going to have, you know, a different type of race to the bottom, which, you know, some could argue that 2003 or 2007 was really a, 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 a battle between King Kong, the GSEs on one hand, and then a bunch of Goliaths on the other hand, all trying to, to you know, out, I wouldn't say outdo each other, out, what's the word for the opposite of that? Out. Uh, out lose each other or something. So, um, you know, and, that's my concern. And are we clear that um, catast the government has to take the catastrophe insurance type risk? Because in other markets, like hurricanes and so forth, uh, the private sector takes catastrophe risk. This is a very big catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> what, what insurers would be able to actually stand up to this kind of catastrophe when you have 20% of uh, possibly mortgages 15% you know, in a default or foreclosure. This is big. 
I would, I would, most of the, I actually study catastrophe insurance. Uh, most of the catastrophe risks are in some form government based. Wind damage in, in Florida is the, Cal, is the Florida Hurricane Fund. It's the state of Florida which has made some terrible pricing mistakes and they're paying for them. Uh, the most interesting example, and it's a case of how this could be done, but it shows you also the problems, is uh, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. Uh, after 9-11, uh, Congress uh, passed a law saying that, and what it says is that the private insurance industry covers uh, basically the first $30 billion of any terrorist attack on a building, on structures in the United States. After that, there's a range of co-insurance and after uh, where the government is a co-partner, and then there's a tranche where the government covers the, the really the extreme events, the nuclear bombs. Um, the, ter the, the upper government tranche in the United States is free. In Europe, it's all priced. And the reason, it's very interesting why Europe is so much better than we are. The EU Act requires that uh, individual governments cannot subsidize insurance. Uh, so if the French decided they were going to subsidize their uh, terrorism insurance, it would be illegal. And the same thing occurs in mortgage insurance, by the way. So it's, it's not coincidental. That it's, it's not as if they're better people than, than we are. But the, the EU forces it. But anyway, the key point is we have modeled, but I don't know how it applies to mortgages. I don't know how you make it work. You know, it's obvious on a building if there's a terrorist attack, the insurer pays the first tranche and then the government steps in. But how do you, individual mortgages are too small, so you're t talking pools and exactly. the, you need the details. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I've already laid out our view, but I, th I think I'm I'm okay with the government insuring, just not the government pricing. I think that you know, there's an endogeneity that takes place with the amount of mortgage credit that can be out there. So once the government prices it, you know they're going to price it wrong, you know they're going to, there's going to be an excess of it, and it will be arbitraged by French institutions. So I, th I think the pricing of it is very, very but, important. But there's no doubt about it, the, the pricing is key. And of course we do price, the government does price in a sense the insurance for banks, the FDIC insurance, and of course That's too my mother big knows, to fail. Exactly, yeah. too big to fail. But there's no way of getting out of that unless we're going to in fact have a market there too. And then there's the issue of the pricing on the private side is subject to this race to the bottom. I'm going to turn it over to the audience after my last question, uh, which is about the appropriate size for the, the role of the explicitly, uh, the explicit low income, riskier housing subsidy through the FHA or, or Gini, Gini May. I mean, how big do we think that that, what we often think of as being the role of the GSE should be? Well, I, I can say, I mean, the HUD budget, I, at least the last time I looked at the numbers, is on the order of $35 billion, which is really very small. It hasn't changed in real terms in probably 30 years or more. Uh, the FHA in principle, it's a good example, FHA in principle, the law requires that they actually base their premiums, the charges, uh, and in fact, I think they've done a pretty good job over most of, of the history. Uh, they currently are having imposed on them a public role that isn't in their basic charter, which is to, to bail out the GSEs and stuff like that. Uh, but um, in, in principle, it's sort of self-regulating. I think the key to the FHA is to set the standards for what you want to achieve. What are the social goals? State them very specifically and then say to the FHA operators, just do this. We don't want a lot of innovation. We don't want you to be so smart. We just want you to execute as we've requested and it's sort of self-controlling. And I would say it ends up about the same size as most European countries. Uh, and that's exactly right. And the FHA, we kind of agree, has worked, and you would certainly need to reinvent it if it wasn't there. Uh, the, it's now in a troubled situation, but then again, anything that touches housing is in a troubled situation. I want to remind ourselves, this is almost a time where homeownership is a dirty word, actually, and of course we've been through a period where everyone encouraged homeownership and thought subprime lending encouraged homeownership, although actually from 2004 on, homeownership decreased, so it was more leverage than homeownership. But on the other hand, we are blessed in the United States with high homeownership rates, and although Dwight Wrightley and uh, Larry earlier show we're in the middle of the pack, in part, and uh, research colleagues, Albert Siason, uh, points to this rent control elsewhere, which in fact makes these um, uh, uh, comparisons difficult. There's uh, more homogeneity in other populations. There are countries with much lower home ownership rates that are similar in structure. Uh, 
and they have been problematic. This has been a very deep problem to their system because there is situations where you have huge development, huge increases in prices, and then you have haves and have-nots that have been very difficult for the political system. So we have to be very careful before we go there. And therefore, this is not a market failure in a, in a traditional sense. This is about income redistribution in particular in terms of generational and across time because wealth is in homes for most middle income families and they are able therefore to pass it on to their children and uh, working families more generally. So with that in mind, we certainly, I think there's some consensus about FHA and Ginny May, but then that's um, the question then goes to, well, what about working class America that's middle America? How far do we go with this? And of course, it's a, not a question for economists to answer. And all I would add is, I mean, society distributes wealth to, to the disadvantaged, and it can come in the form of shelter, which is like housing, food, education, um, health. So they have to decide, you know, which of these four items are the top of the agenda and, and go from there. But I think that should be part of the bigger, longer term debate. And something like the GSEs, which is a very indirect way of um, doing this transfer, creates so much distortions in the marketplace, it can have a negative impact elsewhere. So I think it needs to be much more direct and much more explicit. And I mean, the FHA is more like that, so I think that's a better model. Whether that's the right model, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I agree with that. Okay. Um, have you got a I think we've got a question over there. I think we should... Oh, the mic's right by you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I, uh, Professor Jaffe, mostly for you, but anyone that wants to comment, I just wanted to say it sounds almost too good to be to be true to me that you could you could get the benefits of privatization that you're talking about and not have a decrease in home ownership rates in this country. And and you know you brought up the example of of Europe, um, and there are exceptions. Certainly, Denmark has an active fixed term 30-year market, but by and large in Europe, aren't you looking at a product mix that generally favors shorter terms um, and the and the mortgage products and more floating rate products where you don't have the interest rate risk that we have being sort of subsidized in this country. And I just wanted to ask more generally, I mean, what happens if home ownerships do start to decline in this country? Do we really have the political appetite for uh, privatization if, if, that, if that happens? I, could, could you say, sort of comment on the practicality given the political climate of your of your proposal. I think asking economists to comment on practicality is a... <laughs> but anyway, we'll try. Um, well, f so I would say the, f the first comment is, of course, the houses are already built. Um, um, so it's, it's not a matter of building houses. Uh, and these are single-family detached homes. So the only way they cannot be home, uh, owner-occupied, home ownership, is if they're rented to folks. And I, I wouldn't even take a strong line if it turned out that the market preferred to go that way. To some degree, it is going to go that way in the short run. Uh, but I, I just don't see, see that as a likely outcome. What's going to happen is house prices will have to fall a little bit and, and make these houses affordable. Ultimately, the equilibrium has to be the houses are there, and we need to get a price level that, at which the median American home, household can, can, can afford the median home. And it's, it's, it's going to happen, and it'll be fine. Right. But there's, there you can afford it through rental, or you can afford it through home ownership. And I've, I believe that the rental decline, increase and the home ownership decline that we've seen is just the beginning. The major decline that we've seen so far, although there has been a significant decline in home ownership, several basis points uh, of 2%, two, uh, two is also in household formation. So we have had as... Uh, panelists I'm sure know, uh, 300,000 housing starts or so, and that's because household formation. People are just not moving, as again, colleagues of mine, uh, Jorjorko and Todd Stein, I believe, have shown in their work. Um, and that is, in fact, uh, going to mean a significant increase in rentership when that starts unraveling. Because the first thing that's going to happen when jobs come back is not that people are going to jump into homes. They're going to jump out of living with their parents. If I could just add one thing on, on new housing stock, which would uh, go to Larry's point earlier. I think, you know, you'd, you'd end up with smaller houses. You know, you won't have your uh, eighth bedroom when you uh, have two kids you'll only have 
four bedrooms, or maybe they'll share the bunk room. I don't know. It's. I think that the uh, as Larry d discussed, we built bigger houses than other people in other societies, partly because it's being heavily subsidized. We've but but Matt, it. that confuses, I mean, certainly rental costs are going to go up as well as ownership costs are going to go up in the U.S., in part because of we're not building housing and population is still increasing. Over the longer run, that's going to happen. And that's going to drive smaller rental units as well as smaller owner-occupied, but it doesn't address the issue of home ownership as a percentage. That lady there. Speaking, continuing on with what was just presented, so the housing prices go down, so more people can afford it, the middle class. Well, what happens to these houses that are over a million? I just went into a community the other day. I pass it every Sunday. I thought, oh, let me go in there. The cheapest one was 990000 but most of them were almost near $2 million. So what's going to happen to these houses? when you have uh, smaller rentals opening up, smaller homes are desired. I'm not seeing any response from the home building industry for smaller homes. When I was in this community, I even asked, what's your smallest floor plan? And she showed me a mansion. <laughs> but, but factually, house, prices, uh, house sizes have already declined, factually. Median house size of, is lower in terms of new, new starts. So, yeah. so uh, I'm not disagreeing with, with that, but Overall, for the U.S., that's the case. Yeah, I think you were seeing an outlier. I, I, I don't think it's the rule; it's the exception. It's possibly. I don't know the details, but I mean, Washington's growing. I guess there's a lot of interest here. Yeah, this is a very strong, one of the country's strongest housing markets. Uh, good or bad, depending on whether you own or not. I had the opportunity to spend most of the last week in Florida, and. Of course, many of the counties there are characterized by the majority of the mortgages being underwater. And if we look at projections for the rest of the country for the rest of the year, some analysts will suggest that 50% of the mortgages in this country are going to be underwater by the end of this year. What, what are the implications of that uh, as far as attitudes toward home ownership, as far as uh, uh, the, the middle class? and the working class families well, that, that you were discussing. And, and much more deep, if in fact prices fall 10%, we will have 50% of mortgage holders underwater. What are the implications for the banking system? What are the implications for a second housing price dip for the potential for a second dip in the overall economy? Certainly in the short run, home ownership is not something that people are choosing. They're quite understandably war wary of it. And if housing prices fall further, that will increase that wariness, understandably so. So what, but we need to distinguish between disequilibrium, we are in disequilibrium, and long run equilibrium. And that's part of the problem of why foreclosure crises are in fact significant problems that federal governments must step in because one can get into a cycle of lower prices mean hesitance to purchase because we've got the expected price in going forward in the sense of the user cost. So then, of course, that encourages less demand, and we are then in a disequilibrium cycle. And we were in such a cycle a year or so ago, and we could get there again. Can I add, I, I think a fundamental change that is about to occur, you know, for 30 or 40 or 50 years, uh, America has viewed home ownership as a, a no-fail investment. And, and part of the great desire for everyone to get into home ownership was to have an opportunity to have this asset that only went up in value and you got wealthy uh, simply by owning it. And I think the, that was never really true, but we had a very good run. And, but those days are over. And, the, and once the public recognizes that you, what a building gives you is shelter, not, it's, not a, it's not a stock that's going to go up, it's, a, it's an asset that gives you services at a fair price, 
the goal of this extreme desire for home ownership starts to vanish. Now you look at renting versus home ownership as a very sensible economic decision based on your circumstances. The fact that a house is not a surefire investment has long been the principle in Europe. And, not, and I don't want to say it too extreme, but by and large, Europeans did not view houses as a surefire investment. They did look at it as shelter, and this is why they made much safer mortgages. I mean, I guess it's. Is it better to rent and have a 401k, or is it better to own a house? You know, you could see some equivalence between those mm -hmm. two. Actually, maybe we should wait for the mic. Thank you. I think at one point the panel talked about how in the 80s and most of the 90s, Fannie and Freddie seemed to work pretty well. And it wasn't until the 2000s when uh, Fannie and Freddie no longer controlled standards that we started to see problems emerge. And I guess, you know, we, we're having this whole debate, what, what went wrong, how should we restructure it? But, you know, we have our friends on Capitol Hill. It's going to be very difficult to get anything passed. Why couldn't we simply impose tougher standards on Fannie and Freddie and try to go back to what seemed to work in the 80s and 90s. Is that too practical to work? I mean, I, I guess our view is it didn't work well in the 90s. I agree. That they took on lots of risk in, uh, in terms of the mortgage uh, holdings and guarantees. And I think what the mistake we made was, when you look from 95 to 2005, if you look at the Case-Shiller Index that was mentioned earlier, there was 132 straight months of prices increasing. If you've take, taken out uh, a mortgage mm. and you can't make the payment, but your house property has gone up, you don't default, you sell the house or you refinance. So a lot of what we thought was working well in the 90s was really just a manufacture of the fact that housing prices went up so much. So I think that it's fine to go back to you know, pre-90s maybe to uh, a system where, like Europe, is very, very safe. Um, and I think some of our, both Dwight's and mine, and I think Susan's, is all, all of our uh, suggestions are really about high underwriting, standardization, high quality standards. Uh, the problem is you still are gonna get this uh, mission creep that uh, Dwight talked about, where if you have the government pricing the risk, you're gonna get too much of it. I think we have to distinguish between um, problems that were part of Fannie and Freddie's structure even in the 90s and the global house price rise that occurred throughout the world, not just in the U.S. in the 90s, uh, but throughout the world that was in due in part to the fact that interest rates were falling, especially in the second half of the 90s when the housing prices did in fact increase. I do think that what people were pointing to, economists including all of us, were pointing to as a real risk in the Fannie and Freddie structure was their portfolio and interest rate risk. And ironically, that's not what failed. But in any case, it's clearly a problem. It's clearly a problem. So we wouldn't need to go back there, and should we, we shouldn't go back there. But the question is, why not just bring Fannie and Freddie back and, as it was? And the answer to that is you can't put, talking about genies, another genie back into the bottle. And that is the private label mortgage-backed system that was created and we can't undo it. It will be back there again. And we can't simply wave a wand and put a rule and say, guys, you can't issue securities. Okay, I think we're gonna have one last question, so I'm gonna choose at random. <laughs> uh, no. Yes. Thank you. This question is closely linked to the question from the gentleman who um, made observations about the housing market in Florida. What then is the, are the panelists' views on the optimal government strategy with regard to foreclosures? That is, if you were government officials, what would your response to the foreclosure crisis be? How would you design government's role with regard to foreclosures? <laughs> I, I, um, my position is that uh, obviously a lot of banks have broken the law and haven't followed the, the rules, and, and that's unacceptable behavior in our system. 
but that beyond enforcing the contracts and making sure the judicial processes are, are fulfilled as, 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 as written, uh, I don't think there's a lot the government can do that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem, one of the problems is that a lot of this securitization has sliced and diced the loans, so it's difficult to renegotiate if that was, in fact, optimal. But um, outside of changing the law about what these contracts look like, again, I'm not quite sure what the government could, could do, though. Okay, well, look, thanks very much. I think we have to clear the room so that lunch can be set. But thank you very much to our panelists.